I want you to forget everything you know about mattress retail conferences because we are so excited here at the FAM to announce Sleep Summit 2023, our new flagship event. Hey, if you're at your computer right now, I want you to go to sleepsummit.co. So sleepsummit.co. You're going to get all the details. It's happening October 9th through the 12th in beautiful Bentonville, Arkansas. That's my backyard. And Sleep Summit is built for forward-thinking mattress retailers and furniture retailers who are hunting for ways to make more money, increase profits from big ideas, people who want to optimize their business with AI and automation and new tools. It's for mattress retailers that really need to train their teams to massively grow their sales. And it's for leaders who really need space from the day-to-day to strategize and reflect. This is going to be dynamic presentations. We're going to have engaging breakout sessions, innovative group activities. I want you to block your calendar right now, October 9th through the 12th for Sleep Summit 2023. It's going to be a one-of-a-kind experience. You don't want to miss it. I promise you don't want to miss it. So tickets are available right now. The early bird special is going on. Okay, the prices are going to go up after July 31st. So don't wait. Get your entire team there. Go to sleepsummit.co right now. And we'll see you at Sleep Summit 2023. FAM.NEWS Welcome to the Sleep Summit Show, where we uncover bold ideas with innovators, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders making waves in the sleep industry. With your host, Mark Kinsley. You are about to find out how naps are like cupcakes, what happened when 93 people showed up to a sleep speech, and why Dr. Kimberly Lemke says... Sleep is actually a daytime issue. She is the president and CEO of Drift Sleep Course and much more. And the Sleep Summit show begins right now. We get the best reactions from our customers on the Englander products. Katie and I compare a lot of notes when we're helping people in the store. And when we bring them over to the beds, they just lay down on them and they're like, that's it. They don't want to try anything else. Katie and Greg Law, Sweet Dreams Mattress and Furniture. We've gotten just some of the best feedback from some of the Englander beds. We love them because we know our customers are really happy and sleeping well. Learn more and get started today at englander.com. Dr. Kimberly Lemke, she is a licensed clinical psychologist and certified sleep science coach, the president and CEO of the Drift Sleep Course. You're going to find out all about it. Kimberly, welcome to the show. How are you? Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, it's my pleasure. Okay, wait, I just went into Kimberly. Should I just go with Dr. Lemke? How do you want to? However it is you would like to call me, I can go with the flow on anything. I feel like we're new friends. We chatted ahead of time, so I think we're good to go. We're, we're going to find out. And, and here's the deal. I mean, when you, you're on the Sleep Summit show, a lot of information is going to get out there. Like, we are going to find out, like we do from every guest, where is the strangest place you've ever slept? And If you got to throw somebody in the bus, you got to throw them under the bus. I will do so because I know the answer to that (laughs) question. (laughs) (laughs) I cannot wait to hear this, but we're going to, we're going to get into some of the, the, the rich material around the drift sleep course and your role as a psychologist and the opportunity you saw to help so many more people on the sleep front. And we're going to get into some of the, the material that's in the drift sleep course, because this is the sleep summit show. And we want to make sure that we are getting as much education as possible and uncovering as much as we can about the sleep space. Uh, Okay. So we are going to get to the strangest place you've ever slept, but first the sleep summit quiz question. And I got this one from you. Okay. So what's the one sense you have that doesn't go to sleep? Now, Dr. Lemke, I know you know the answer to this, but I want everybody to be thinking about it. And you can answer it later on in the show and then explain to us what's going on and how we need to pay attention to that one system and how it relates to our sleep and how it could damage our sleep. Yes. It's, it's one of my most interesting fun facts. So I'm excited to share it with everybody. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm excited to hear more about your background. And, but let's start right off the top with the Drift course. So if you go to driftcourse.com, you can see this course that you put together, tell us what it is and give us the backstory about it. So I have a private practice and I was seeing individual clients and we were working on anxiety and depression and parenting struggles and productivity issues. And what ended up happening is I always would get to the question about how's your sleep? And inevitably it was bad for, for a few reasons. So 
we started to notice that it was either I put my head on the pillow and I couldn't fall asleep or I'd wake up at two or 3 a.m. sort of the dreaded um, mid uh, night awakening and then couldn't fall back asleep or it didn't matter because my mind just wouldn't shut off. And so I just started to see those three groups of people just consistently show up. And as they did, I felt like it was just limited in terms of getting out some of the information I was learning to help people sleep better. So what ended up happening is I, I took these courses, I got more trained in it, and I started locally just to ask a few local libraries and say, hey, and I come from a, a kind of a, a small town. And I said, hey, do you guys want um, some information on how to sleep better? And what usually is like a 20 or 30 person um, course, if you will, a 20, 30 minute um, presentation, I had people who um, there was 93 of them who came in and were signed up for it, which just absolutely highlighted how important sleep is for everybody. And it just took off from there. People just constantly were asking me questions, whether it's, you know, my partner doesn't sleep, what do I do with that? Or I have kids that don't sleep, what do I do with that? Or what do I do when I wake up at three in the morning? How do I shut my brain off at night? Um, questions about good mattresses, questions about nighttime aids. And so there was all these things showing up. And the thing that is so important that I try to get out there is that we also have to understand how to structure our days. So it, it's, it's really sleep is a daytime issue because if we're not managing our days, we're not going to sleep well at night. And so I really am so passionate about helping people understand doable things during the day that they can do that do not take a whole bunch of time or effort that will absolutely help them sleep at night. And so that's where I really come from is how do we help you structure your days so that at night you put your head on the pillow, you lay in your mattress and you're comfy cozy and you're able to fall asleep and then stay asleep too. What are some of the biggest mistakes people are making in terms of structuring their day? And what are some of the top pieces of advice you give people in terms of how do I manage my day so that I get ready for a good night of sleep? What, what are some of those uh, off the top of your head things you see that, oh, this is a common mistake? Yeah. So I'm a super visual person and I'm Italian, so I use my hands. Um, but one of the things that I use is this idea of a sleep balloon. And I tell clients all the time in organizations that the key is that sleep is a chemical process. We have to build sleep chemicals and we have to build this balloon really as taut as tight as we can because that's what gets us through our nights so as we sort of build this throughout our days with these sleep chemicals then at night that's what we're using and we deflate it and then we wake up and so it's this constant sort of relay if you will right of building them and using them and building them and using them and so one of the main things that builds those sleep chemicals is sunlight and we know that there's sort of a deep part of our brain that really has a mechanism in there that its sole purpose, for the most part, one of its main purposes is to let you know it's sensing sunlight and it starts your other systems. It starts waking them up. It starts building those chemicals saying, hey, we notice it's light. We know what to do with that, right? Let's shut off melatonin in a sense and let's start building sort of these sort of weight chemicals. And so I tell you know people all the time that if you can just get any sunlight into your body, it's so helpful. It really just reinforces to your body, hey, we're still supposed to be up. You know, it keeps us a little bit more energized, keeps fatigue away. Um, and one of the things I hear Mark a lot is I'm fatigued. And so what they do, and which is a common error, is they go after sleep, um, you know, in terms of how do I change it up? What can I do different? And sometimes fatigue is not a sleep issue. Um, it's a fatigue issue. And so, you know, we talk about ways to manage fatigue, which is right, getting light, movement, uh, nutrition, exercise, um, keeping a, um, a schedule. So when you're eating, those sort of things. And all of that is really key. And that's what builds those sleep chemicals really as taut as tight as we need it to be. I like the visual too. So I'm just imagining this pink balloon. And throughout the day, you have these opportunities to blow some more air into it. And one of the ways to blow up that pink sleep balloon is, boom, I stepped out into the sunlight. Great. Uh, that balloon just got bigger. And so that means I'm going to have more of those really good nighttime chemicals that are going to be able to release themselves and hopefully keep me asleep throughout the night. Going back to one of the issues you just described. Are there any other ways besides sunlight that those 
good chemicals build up throughout the day? So think about those five senses, right? And I'm not giving away the answer to this quiz, um, but I'm just going to reiterate the five senses, right? So it's, and I use my hand to illustrate because I had a seven-year-old show me one time and I just will never forget it. So she says, you know, what do you hear? What do you see? What do you smell? What do you taste? And what do you touch, right? And those are your five senses. And the more you stimulate those, the more you build those chemicals. So, right, if I am just sitting here and I'm working and I can't get outside, right? And I think, okay, I can't get outside necessarily get sunlight, but I still got senses to work with, right? So can I get up? Can I sort of move my eyes around, right? Can I take in sort of different data for a minute and start stimulating senses that way? Can I, I'll tell clients all the time, right? You have a taste one. At any time at my desk, I have typically like big red because nothing will wake you up like big red um, or anything else that's just sort of jarring, right? Or, you know, if let's say you're a tea drinker, Put a um, cinnamon stick in it, right? That's just different for you, right? Get a different flavor of a tea or a coffee. So if you think about it, you can do things that sort of stimulate your senses, which will build those sleep chemicals. So even if I can't get up, but because I got meetings all day, but I have sort of a, a my tea set out already with like, you know, a special sort of smell to it or whatever it is, that will also build those sleep chemicals because I'm stimulating those senses. So smelly candles, lotions, um, we talk a lot about lavenders at night, which are great, right? It's, it's aromatherapy can be very helpful. There's also aromatherapy that can help during the day. So anything that stimulates it, citrus, you know, I have a, I have a grapefruit one I like and a lemon one because it just, it's stimulating, right? It keeps me awake, right? All of those things are building those sleep chemicals. So it doesn't require a lot. It just requires you to sort of be aware of it so that you can take advantage of it during your day. I think about the inverse of what you just described as bedtime routine. Yes. And one of the things that I talk a lot about when people ask me, Hey, how can I get a good night's sleep? And we're not talking about mattresses. It really comes down to a bedtime. So let's, let's go from the daytime to bedtime. Talk about that because I think it can be very anxiety inducing for a lot of people. How do you tell them that a bedtime routine benefits them? And then what are some good best practices for creating a bedtime routine? It's a great question. It's, it's huge. I I have 12 year old twins and I remember right when they were babies, if they're supposed to go to bed at eight at like seven 45, that's not when I started, right? I didn't just bring them upstairs throw them in their, you know, bed and be like, ah, you know, mommy out, right? Like, you, you know, you have to, you know, you give them a bath, right? You take them maybe on an evening walk, you play soft, soothing music, you read them a story. Um, you might have them do stretching. There's so many things that we do for our kids that we don't do for ourselves. And so I tell adults, there is absolutely nothing different about you. You also need to shut down your system. Your body wants to sleep. Your brain wants to sleep, right? It it wants to heal, right? It wants to flush itself out, right? It wants to get rid of, you know, the toxins it's built during the day. You've given it information during the day. It has to organize. So your body wants to sleep. And so that nighttime routine is you working with your body to start shutting it down, right? You start dimming the lights. You start, right, if you can, turning off the cell phones, the computers, you start maybe putting the lavender scents out. Maybe you take a bath or, you know, a, a shower if those are calming to you. I tell people progressive muscle relaxation. Um, if you just Google that, there's a billion different transcripts you can follow on that. And so you're really setting yourself up so that it's like a computer. You're just sort of shutting it down, you know, one step at a time, one tab at a time so that it can then fall into sleep. And it's going to be very hard to do that if, you know, your bedtime's 10 and at 9.58, you just close the computer and try to lay down. You really want to create that nighttime routine to start sort of shutting it down your body so that it starts triggering what it needs to to start putting you to sleep. Talking with Dr. Kimberly Lemke, taking us to school on all things sleep. I love it. She created the Drift Course. It is at driftcourse.com. And I like this. You say in less than 14 minutes, you will know the secrets to falling asleep and staying asleep. What are some of the biggest challenges with people you've worked with that you've seen them able to overcome with adopting sleep strategies? And about how long does it take typically? Because I mean, you know, doing it one night, doing it two nights, 21 nights, a year? 
So I think the amount of time depends on the severity of your sleep issues, right? Some people have had insomnia for years, you know, and it becomes a little bit harder and a little bit longer of a process. One of the things that is so important is, and this is where I think, you know, people look at this strategy and think I've lost my mind, um, is this idea of our bed being somewhere where we sleep right? That's what the bed is for, right? So I, I tell people a mattress and a bed is for sleep and sex, and that is it. We're not in there reading. We're not in there doing work. We're not in there watching TV. That is what it is for. And, and the reason is, so there's, um, so Pavlov, Pavlov, I don't know if you, you know of him, but he's right. A, a scientist basically who he had dogs, right? And he would have a dog and he would show it meat. And you know, as soon as he did, the dog would drool. And we would expect that, right? It's it's natural. And then he sort of paired that meat with a bell. And and so we would see the dog drool. And we should, because the meat is still present, right? And this might sound like, why is she talking about dogs and meat? But I promise you, it has to do with sleep. Um, and so what happens is, right? Like, so you keep pairing it. And then he would remove the meat and just play the bell. And we still notice that the dogs would drool. And the reason is, is that he paired, right? And it's a sort of a conditioning we have as people and humans that we pair things together that shouldn't be paired. So we should not see a dog drooling to a bell. It makes no biological sense, but we've paired it over time. Sleep is very similar. If we pair our mattress with somewhere that we're awake, we condition ourselves to believe that when we get in bed, this is somewhere that we're awake. And what we're trying to do is do the opposite and condition ourselves that sleep is somewhere that is happening only on a mattress. And so I tell people, if you are waking up in the middle of the night and you are up more than 15 to 20 minutes, the one of the main you know tips and secrets I have is that you do have to get out of that bed. Um, now, you don't, it's not like you're putting yourself in a timeout, right? Like you're not in trouble, um, you know, but you're going to somewhere that's sort of, I call it a comfy place. So it's somewhere that you can relax and you could be calm and, you know, we got lighting low, but we're waiting to see signs of sleep, not tired. So sleep is, right, my eyes closing, my head bobbing. As soon as I see sleep signs, not tired signs, I go to my bed um, because that's what I want to start pairing is as soon as my body and my head hit that pillow and I'm in bed that I've paired that to where I'm asleep and not where I'm awake and watching TV and reading books or whatever it is. So the comfy place is somewhere you'd have maybe a like a book lamp or a low light. Yeah. So it's not I'm not flipping on the overhead lights. Do you recommend that people actually read? I, I talk about reading fiction versus reading nonfiction. Nonfiction is like, hey, have you ever read a kid a bedtime story versus read, having them read a math book? Yes. No, you would have them do a bedtime story. So can you read when you get up in that situation? You can, I, I, there's a sort of a worksheet in that course that I talk about, like doing an experiment, which is everybody is so different, right? So for me, if you put me, I think it was just years of grad school, like you put me in front of any book and I'm going to fall asleep. I just, you know, I just am right. And so it doesn't matter what type of book it is for me, but you have to really sort of do an experiment with yourself. And if you read nonfiction or fiction, either one and you fall asleep, great. If you read either one and it keeps you awake, cross it off, right? Listening to music, that's great. If there's a type of music that's alerting and it starts getting you jazzed, right? That's not what you need to be listening to, right? So it's really this idea of experiment with yourself when you're in that zone. And if the things you are doing are helping sort of increase those signs of sleepy sooner, then do more of that. And again, you might do something that you think would be helpful and it's actually alerting, so we take that off the table and you do something else. I learned something new about my wife the other day. She told me, do you ever wake up in the middle of the night and you're singing songs in your head? And I thought about it for a moment. And I said, no, I, I, that doesn't really happen to me. She goes, I have to tell myself, no singing. That's not going to help you get back to, to bed. She's like, I was singing to Lizzo in the middle of the night when I woke up the other day. Oh my God, I she's like, that. I had to tell myself no singing. And I'm like, you have to tell yourself no singing. She's like, yes, I have to tell myself I no singing. I think her and I would be best friends because I love singing. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, you said right? You, talk, like, you said you talk with your hands and you're Italian. She is too. Okay. See, she, and both of us would absolutely wake up to Lizzo without a doubt. Um, <laughs> with, without a doubt. And it's, you know, it's interesting because I, 
when you say that, my kids will know it's about me too. You can't give me songs with words too close to bed because I will sing. Like I just, I have a problem, right? Like I just want to sing along. So I will have to put on like instrumental stuff or stuff I've heard a thousand times that like I don't even pay attention to. But if you give me like a new song that I like with words, no, nah, it ain't going to go well. <laughs> So that's how you sabotage your sleep, right? Yes. You put on some Lizzo or just, you know some fresh new T Swifty, yes. and you're out of the gate. You're humming it all night long. It's so okay, true. I got it. It's so true. <laughs> and again, I think you know that once people understand that sleep balloon analogy, you start to really be able to answer for yourself how am I sabotaging sleep, right? So I, I always tell people that I work with or that I coach or that I do workshops for, you know, I, I'll say I never have to teach birds how to sleep or cows how to sleep, right? they know how we get in our way. So if you understand the idea of that sleep balloon and what builds those chemicals as people, I see so frequently, I didn't have a good night's sleep last night. And so tonight I'm going to go to bed earlier. Mm. Now, if you understand what we're talking about with the sleep balloon idea, right? If I go to bed earlier, it does not help me get a good night's sleep, right? It's going to affect now this night and then this night. So I might be so focused on catching off that I'm doing things that are interrupting current sleep. So if I go to bed earlier, I'm not getting sunlight. I'm not stimulating my senses. I'm probably laying there tired, but awake. And so I'm not, I'm not building any sleep chemicals, which means I'm going to have a poor night's sleep. Or if let's say, you know, you, you want to sleep in in the morning because you had a poor night's sleep the night before. In theory, it makes sense. But if I sleep in now until 10, which I don't even think I've done in 20 years, but if I did, right, I'm not getting sleep. I'm not getting any morning sun. I'm not getting any movement in. I've now thrown off my schedule. So we do things to try to compensate for poor sleep that continues to set us up for poor night's sleep. And so we just have to allow ourselves not to catastrophize it. Have a bad night's sleep. It's fine. Right. We, we will we will absolutely make up for that, but we have to get out of our own way and not sabotage it. Have your bad night's sleep, wake up, get out in the sunlight yes. right away and to nap or not to nap. How are naps like cupcakes? If you think about a, a, a diabetic and you think about a non-diabetic, a cupcake in and of itself is fine. A nap in and of itself is is fine. It's its own thing. If let's say if I have a, if I'm sitting next to a diabetic and they eat this cupcake, it is going to absolutely affect their system a lot worse than if I eat it not as a diabetic. And so naps are very similar. So if let's say I don't have an issue sleeping and I want a nap, I'm not. I I told you this earlier that people get mad when I go after their naps if they're nappers. It's like you don't touch somebody's nap. If you have trouble sleeping, though, you have to look at it because it's like a cupcake in that it's going to affect certain people who struggle with things differently and, and a lot more intensely. So if let's say I take a two hour nap and I'm a poor sleeper, that is two hours during my day of two things. One, I'm not building it. And the other thing I'm doing is I'm using those sleep chemicals that I've already built. So my balloon is getting a little soggy, if you will, the more I use those nap chemicals. So your body doesn't know, oh, these are nap chemicals. These are sleep chemicals at night. It doesn't know you're using them. And once they're gone, they're gone. So really be mindful of that, right? That if you are somebody who doesn't have sleep issues and you want a nap and just like that cupcake, you want to eat it, great. If you're somebody who really struggles though with sleep and you're taking naps, I really look at those and see if you can either take them out or, you know, safety wise, if you have to have one that you limit it, you know, if you can limit it to, let's say a 30 minute nap or something like that to where, you know, we use some of them, but we're not using a lot of them. Do you find it's better just for overall health and wellness and sleep health to have that contiguous sleep at night, that uninterrupted sleep at night? Um, rather than the nap? Uh, yeah. I mean, so fragmented sleep, obviously, meaning if you wake up, you know, during the night, but you still kind of get the amount that you need. Um, or can some people, you know, m maybe this is a minority of people, but can they get a little bit less sleep at night and, you know, supplement that sleep with a nap? Uh, I'm just, those are maybe yeah. kind of the one-off cases that we don't want to like 
create any type of broad brush strokes around, but I'm, I'm always curious, like, okay, uh, does that contiguous sleep do some things for your body? Um, I've heard about sleep spindles happening between hour six and seven that help with your motor movements, things like that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. We, you know, we cycle through sleep stages. So sleep isn't a consistent um, process. Sleep, you know, really fluctuate throughout the day and you enter into various stages of sleep and the various stages of sleep have different functions for us. Those deeper stages of sleep and those REM, right, that's where a lot of restorative sleep happens, right? That's where we literally see our brain being washed, if you will, when we're asleep. Um, when we get into those deeper stages, we see memories being stored. You know, we see a lot of, of, of positive benefits to hitting those later stages of sleep. So, you know, I would really recommend that we keep it as continuous as possible so that we can sort of hit those later stages of sleep. So you're absolutely better, you know, it's quality, not quantity, right? So if you can, if you can lay in, in, in your bed asleep and hit those throughout the night, that's what we want to do rather than, you know, I'm going to take five here at night, get two in during the day. And we really want sort of a, a quality nighttime routine to or a nighttime sort of path, if you will, sleep wise, so that we get the health effects of good sleep. It's a fascinating exercise too. If you ever sit down and you think about your, your sleep in terms of 90 minute segments, you know, a full sleep cycle. So a friend of mine, um, had, had read a, a book by a sleep doctor and he decided he was going to map out his sleep cycle. So that's what he counts instead of, instead of a night of sleep. And so what he found is that, you know, if you're going to get, you know, five good sleep cycles for your night of sleep and he goes to bed at 10 30, 10 o'clock. Let's, uh, let's say 10 30. That's an easier one. So 10 30 to 12, that's one. And then 1 30, 3, 4 30, and then 6 at 6 a.m. So he, w w hang with me on this if you're listening and you're not watching because we, we could do some hand movements here, but I know math doesn't always translate to the audio side of things. But so that's five sleep cycles and you get 90 minutes for every sleep cycle. And what he found was, if he continued sleeping past 6 a.m. and he got up at, say, 6.30 or 7 even, he didn't actually complete another full cycle, so it didn't give him the full benefits of that restorative sleep cycle. So timing out your sleep and mapping out your sleep in that way, that may be like, you know, next level yeah. type of information, yeah. but he had a lot of success with that. Yeah. Well, because he, he sort of saw, right, like what happens when you complete the cycles, right, is that it does have a very healthy effect on your system. W one thing I see is, is it, people really try to manage their sleep and they really try to control it. And sometimes that can work against us too. So, you know, I'll have people who, whether it's, you know, their electronic devices that they wear, whatever it is, you know, they'll, they'll feel like they slept fine. And then they'll sort of look at their watch and be like, Oh, I must not have slept fine. And then they try to like interfere with it or they double think in like, okay, today I'm going to, and so what we find too sometimes is like our heads get in the way. If we try to control it too much, right, we get in our own way, which is why going back to, I don't teach birds how to sleep. I don't teach, they don't get in their way, right? They just like, okay, maybe they're up all night. Well, they're going to even it out somehow, right? So a hundred percent agree with you. And we have to understand those sleep cycles and we want to get in as many as we can. We also don't want to overthink it because then we're going to get anxious because, we're not getting the right amount and then anxiety will never help you sleep in like the history of anxiety. Right. So, you know, it's sort of that idea too, of don't make yourself too anxious about it because now we're going to create a whole nother issue um, at night that we don't want to create if we don't have to. I think everybody should just relax, yes. like truly just relax. And I'm going to tell you why, because there is part of your body brain. It's a sense that doesn't go to sleep. And that, that was our sleep summit quiz question. I think it's time that we, we brought this back to the surface. What is the one sense you have that doesn't go to sleep? And, and, and I'm saying that in, in it's kind of like a dolphin swimming through the water with one eye open, right? Half of their brain doesn't go to sleep. You've got part of you that's staying awake to make sure everything's, you know, checked up on or, you know, everything's good. So, okay, Dr. Lemke, what is the one part what is the one sense that doesn't go to sleep and explain this to us? Cause I had never heard this. Yeah. So the one sense that will not go to sleep and the one system is our auditory system. 
And the reason is it's it's to keep us alive, right? So we want to be able to hear if something's coming or somebody's coming, right? There's there's right life benefits to that, right? So our our body will not shut that off completely. It will sort of it will mute it a little bit, but it will always be on. So that's why our fire alarms are auditory. That's why the alarms that wake us up um, are auditory. It's because that one system is always awake in the background, and so there's a blessing to that and there's a curse to that. So the the blessing becomes right like safety wise that system is always running. Curse wise is if you are playing things in the background to help you sleep, um your body is aware you're doing it. So uh I told you earlier I'm, I'm a little bit of like a Hallmark spaz. Um like I adore it way too much. Um and so it is so consistent because every movie is like the exact same, right? That what I'm typically watching at 9 p.m. is going to be almost exactly the same as the one I'm watching at 1 p.m., right? A lot of stations or a lot of music doesn't necessarily hold true to that. And so, you know, you will see uh, commercials come on and become louder. And the reason is because they're taking advantage of that. So I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but, you know, you're like watching something, all of a sudden a commercial comes on and you're like, oh my gosh, right? And the reason is mm-hmm. it knows that that one doesn't go to sleep. And if you are asleep, it wants to wake you back up to pay attention to what they're trying to sell you. Um, so just be very mindful of that. So the noise machines, if you're, if you're falling asleep to any sort of podcasts or sleep stories or music, you just want to be sure that there's nothing happening throughout your night that is going to wake you up because as soon as your that sense sort of feels something shift it's going to wake you up just to make sure you're safe and so you really want to minimize that so i'm more of a fan of things like fans or you know white noises or you know there's pink noise brown noise because nothing will shift on those um typically within those um versus when you're doing anything that is verbal or anything that's musical you can have shifts in that that can wake you up wow cool great fact great sleep summit quiz question so now you get something to take back to your office the water cooler your team and you can uh, educate them just like dr kimberly lemke did with us today it's so great to have you on the sleep summit show how can people get connected with you should they go to driftcourse.com is that the best way to reach out So driftcourse.com, or you can go to LinkedIn, Dr. Kimberly Lemke, Instagram, Dr. Kimberly Lemke, just Dr. Kimberly Lemke, and you'll you'll find me somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Not napping. Not napping. Stay awake. (laughs) Oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. We we are not done yet, though. We are not done yet because we have not found out the strangest place (laughs) Dr. Kimberly Lemke has ever slept. Lord, um, I have a dear friend, Stephanie, who is going to hate me saying this. Um, so I don't camp well. Um, there's too many critters. And she promised me this was like a week or this was about a year ago that if I went camping with her, that um, she would have a blow up mattress in the back. We would ha- it would be super comfy. Everything would be great. And so she brought this mattress to blow up in her car. Um, and at 11 o'clock at night, uh, her battery was dead. Um, and we were around nobody who could come help us. And so seats wouldn't tilt back. Mattresses didn't blow up. Um, There's absolutely nothing. And it was like the middle of summer. So we had to both sort of like lean against the window in the back seat and then constantly open the door just to get air and then close it because mosquitoes would come in. Um, And so I, you know, she, she knew that um, I wasn't, I was, it was so bad. And so as we're laying there opening and closing this, something else must have shorted in her car that set off an alarm that would go off every 20 minutes. And so we would, we would be laying in the back, opening and closing it, trying to breathe, not letting in mosquitoes. And then every 30 minutes, like this loud blaring um, alarm would go off. And so that by far is the weirdest and most horrible place I have ever slept. And so in the morning, I grac- graciously asked for somebody to jump the car so that I could go home. <laughs> I was done. <laughs> never to go camping that, again yeah that's a comedy of errors it's like one thing after another after another after you're so you're not gonna she's not gonna drag you into camping again she's Ever she's not again. gonna sell you on like hey i've got an rv <laughs> it's the same type that like rock bands tour in you're not in no you're not i, in I for adore it. her but i will no longer trust her <laughs> <laughs> most things i will when it comes to camping like ease she has lost complete i've lost trust in her 
I still adore her if she's listening, but I will not sleep with her in that car. She's keeping, again. she's, she's trying to balance out all the good work you're doing with making sure that nobody gets a good night's sleep. She did when they so go very camping. well, I might say. <laughs> <laughs> Well, sorry, sorry, bestie, but there's not going to be a repeat try on this one. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe there'll be a repeat with us. We, I'd love to catch up with you again, Dr. Lemke. Thank you so much for being on the Sleep Summit show. You're amazing. And thank you for all the good work you're doing in the industry. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Mm -hmm.